Today we're thinking about why reflection on Jesus Christ needs to be central to eco-theology. I address this question from the perspective of systematic theology, which of course takes its starting point from scripture, but also engages with the tradition of Christian thought about Christ. I retrace some ancient and future directions in Christological thought framed by the basic question, if in Christ God really is reconciling all things to God's self, how is this good news for the whole of the more than human creation? My starting point is the biblical theme of wisdom. And from there, I'll make a brief foray into Trinitarian theology and Franciscan thought. I'll finish with a reflection on resurrection as the inauguration of a new creation and eschatology as the future hope of creation restored. Vicky has already spoken about the importance of the biblical theme of wisdom in revealing God's care for the whole creation. So I don't want to cover the same ground, but perhaps to recap and build on what she's shown us. In the Hebrew Bible, for example, in the book of Job and in Proverbs, the subversive voice of wisdom is presented as the prototype of creation and the divine presence within creation that demonstrates God's providential care for the, for the non-human world. The goal of human life is to live in harmony with divine wisdom, which is also seen as the basis of justice, commerce, beauty and harmony. In the deuterocanonical or intertestamental books like Sirach and the Wisdom of Solomon, there's a further development with wisdom depicted both as Torah and as the Logos or intermediary between God and creation. But notice that from the very beginning, wisdom theology links God's providential care for the more than human creation with the human spirituality of intersubjectivity or relationality. In the New Testament, wisdom Christology is an important, although by no means the only, strand of reflection on the meaning of Christ. Whereas in St Mark's Gospel, Jesus looks and acts like a wisdom sage, by the time we get to Matthew and Luke, Jesus can speak as the personification of divine wisdom. And in the fourth gospel, Jesus is revealed from the outset as the Logos, the word and pre-existent wisdom of God. Wisdom Christology functions as a bridge between Jesus of Nazareth, understood as a wisdom sage, and the Christ of faith, understood as divine wisdom. Through its roots in the Hebrew wisdom tradition, New Testament wisdom Christology articulates the connection between the divine life and the entire created order. As the word and wisdom of God, Christ is understood as the primal self-expressive utterance of God, the most complete and perfect self-communication and self-gift, and for this reason, the exemplar or prototype of every creative expression. Already in intertestamental documents and into the New Testament, we see Hebrew theology beginning to wrestle with the currents of Greek philosophical thought, described by scholars as Middle Platonism, or a sort of almost contradictory fusion between Stoic and Platonist thought. From Platonism, we get that all of phenomenal reality is grounded in the divine mind in the eternal ideas. The real version of things is in the divine mind, while the shadowy representation is on the plane of created reality. We see this explicitly, for example, in the letter to the Hebrews. St. Paul also draws on Stoicism, as does the Gospel of John, with its reference to the Logos as the intermediary between the divine mind and phenomenal reality. Early Christian thinkers are wrestling with this, and origin of Alexandria in the early 3rd century follows the 1st century Jewish thinker Philo in making the fundamental connection that the Hellenistic notion of the divine ideas as the basis of created reality must coincide with the divine wisdom of the Hebrew scriptures. This sets the direction of Christian theology for the next 1,000 years. It also completely upends the Platonist view of phenomenal reality as basically a wishy-washy copy of what's in God's head. Because, says Origen, the divine ideas of Platonism, 
the fundamental creative expressions of God must be situated in the word and wisdom of God, which is Christ. So Christ is the creative exemplar, excuse me. But Christ also takes on created flesh in the incarnation. So that means that right from the beginning, creation is related to the incarnation. Created flesh is capable of bearing the incarnation of the word of God. So that makes creation no mere wishy-washy copy, but grounded in Christ as its origin and existential center. Origin even coins a phrase that we next hear 1800 or so years later when it bobs up again in process theology. The world, Origen claims, is nothing less than God's body. We've seen then that Hebrew wisdom theology puts God in direct loving relationship with the whole of the more than human creation. Wisdom Christology builds on this and incorporates the language of Middle Platonism to identify Jesus, the wisdom prophet, as Christ, the pre-existent wisdom and word of God. Origen sets the course for a Christian Neoplatonism by recognising that creation must be grounded in the eternal word and that the incarnation of the divine word as Jesus Christ is the work that is foreshadowed and hidden in creation from the outset. I now want to turn to emerging Trinitarian understandings of Christ and creation. Because he is a couple of centuries too early, Origen doesn't know about the Trinity as the theological outworking of the Chalcedonian settlement, that in Christ there are two complete natures, the divine and the human. And so Origen holds a somewhat subordinated view of Christ that later will be challenged. St. Augustine, on the other hand, Writing in the decades before and after the First Council of Nicaea, Augustine develops a Trinitarian Christian Neoplatonism to arguably its highest degree. The next great move is made by Maximus Confessor in the early 7th century, who builds on his critique of origin to arrive at a theology of salvation that includes the whole cosmos. For Maximus, the incarnation is part of God's plan from the very beginning as a way of drawing all of creation into participation in the life of the Trinity. Maximus sees no fundamental separation between the created order and the life of the Trinity because in the incarnation, the word of God is inseparably connected with created flesh. That makes creation holy, capable of being joined to the divine life, but it also confers on human creatures a special vocation. Humanity, for Maximus, occupies a special place in creation between the world of nature and of grace. The salvation of the entire cosmos is dependent on human divinization, but eventually all created reality is drawn to its completion in Christ. Writing before the great schism between Western and Eastern Christianity, Maximus articulates a truly cosmic vision of Christ. This vision continues to underlie orthodox theology, which sees itself as flowing from the Maximian doctrine of theosis or divinization, and so recognises a fundamental continuity between nature and grace. Since Maximus, however, Western theology has moved away from the cosmic doctrine of Christ to such an extent that nature is generally viewed as extrinsic to grace, and fallen human nature is able only to be rescued from rather than transformed within its created state. One major exception is found in Franciscan thought, and in particular the 13th century Franciscan theologian Saint Bonaventure who attempts to put theological structure on the intuition of St. Francis that the centre of creation is Christ. For Francis, all created things are radiant as icons of Christ. Francis understands all created things as brother and sister because of their common origin in Christ. Perhaps the central feature of Franciscan spirituality is the practice of poverty, understood as the refusal to regard created objects or living creatures as possessions. This leaves Francis and his followers free to delight in the beauty and the being of the world around them. It is, of course, 
the opposite of the postmodern spirituality of consumerism. Bonaventure follows the Christian Neoplatonism of St. Augustine, as well as receiving a good dose of the Eastern theological tradition through Maximus, and so sees an affinity between the Trinitarian life of God and the life of creation, with all created entities grounded in the Word as exemplar. He uses this to develop a Trinitarian theology of creation centred on Christ, and affirms the, the fundamental kinship of all creation experienced by Francis. The question of the relevance of Christology to a contemporary eco-theology necessarily leads us into the area of Trinitarian theology because, as Catherine Lacuna points out, theology, or words about God, is intimately connected to soteriology, or words about salvation. The nature of God in God's self is intimately connected with the relationship between God and creation. Or as Karl Reiner coined the phrase, there is a necessary congruence between the imminent trinity and the trinity in the oikonomia of creation. Ecotheology similarly recognises a congruence between the structure of relationships in the more than human ecology and the inner Trinitarian life of God. Trinitarian thought also leads us into consideration of questions of power and desire with which ecotheology must be concerned. For Bonaventure, the Trinity is envisaged as a dynamic self-emptying or self-outpouring of love. The Father is emptied in self-donation in the generation of the Word. And the Word in turn is poured out in self-emptying love for the Father in the spiration or outbreathing of the Spirit. In a similar way, Bonaventure understands the act of creation as the canotic outpouring of the Word as exemplar. This reflects the Franciscan emphasis on poverty. Every created thing is ontologically grounded in the word as the creative self-expression or utterance of God. This makes Christ the centre of created reality and also establishes creation as a word of God. For Bonaventure, every created thing resembles the uncreated thing as a vestige, as a likeness for non-rational creatures or as a similitude for human creatures. The implication is that the whole of creation, not just human beings, reflects the Trinitarian life of God. This establishes also the kinship of creation because all creation shares a common origin. However, for Bonaventure, as for Francis, the human vocation of identification with the crucified Christ is essential for the redemption of the entire created order. Through poverty or a human spirituality of intersubjectivity based on a deep awareness of kinship with the non-human world, the order of relations within the more than human ecology is capable of bearing the incarnation of the inner Trinitarian relations of love. So, early Trinitarian theologians build on the Christology of origin. Augustine describes the participation of created reality in the life of the Trinity through the eternal ideas in the eternal word. Maximus, revered alike by Western and Eastern Christian traditions, develops the idea of theosis or divinization, which basically sees the incarnation of the word as the whole point of creation and union with Christ as the telos or final destination of the entire created order. Franciscan thought, which through Bonaventure inherits the Eastern emphasis on the linkage between creation and the divine life, agrees in seeing Christ as the centre of the created order and creation itself as the self-expressive outpouring of the Trinitarian life of God. Franciscan spirituality is also unique in the Western Church as it insists that the highest form of union with Christ is experienced within the crucible of creation. Like other medieval theologians, Bonaventure developed a theology of spiritual ascent based on the mystical theology of the 5th century pseudonymous author called Dionysius the Oropagite, or Polsidar. 
Many of these systems are based on apophatic withdrawal. Bonaventure's Franciscan system of spiritual ascent, however, is based on a radical identification with the suffering Christ, reflecting the experience of St. Francis, whose penultimate spiritual vision involved the reception of the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. Bonaventure sees the ecstasis of union with the crucified one as a Passover into the tomb or sleep of Holy Saturday which is followed by the recreation of all things on Easter Day. And so now we now turn to consider the significance of resurrection for the redemption of the earth. In Franciscan spirituality, the meaning of the resurrection of Christ is not just the restoration, is not just the restoration of our human relationship to God, but the renewal and reordering of the whole creation. The arena of God's saving action, in this view, is not in some disembodied spiritual realm, but in the more than human ecology. Noting the disagreement between those modern commentators who see the earth as being annihilated in the eschaton, and others who see it as being transformed in the eschaton, Jürgen Moltmann notes that, well, if in fact the earth is annihilated and then recreated, then at the very least, the new earth must bear continuity with the current one. Conversely, a creation renovated and transformed in the eschaton must be so changed as to be utterly new. The orthodox position of theosis, or the divinization of the earth in the eschaton, seems to hold the extremes embraced by Western theologians in a creative tension. Moltmann also reminds us that the fulfilment of the eschaton, however conceived, can be based on nothing other than the warrant and promise of the remembered forward hope of resurrection. In Bonaventure's Franciscan spiritual vision, the crucified Christ stands as the most extreme coincidence of opposites, eternity and temporality, life and death, suffering and love. Christ is thus simultaneously the centre of the created order and the midpoint or nexus between creation and God. Bonaventure interprets St. Francis's vision of the crucified Christ and his reception of the stigmata as being a state of union with the crucified Christ and solidarity with Christ in death, which becomes the threshold of resurrection and new creation. This new creation for Bonaventure is a state of shalom or peace, epitomised by Francis's own praxis of piety, the awareness of consanguinity or kinship with all creation as an icon of Christ. Bonaventure builds on the biblical theme of shalom as God's original intention for peace within creation that of course is lost in Eden and becomes Thereafter, the eschatological, prophets in, uh, eschatological promise in the prophets, especially in Isaiah, as the day of the Lord. The consistent promise in the Hebrew Scriptures is never a disembodied state of salvation, but always the restoration of creation to the state originally intended by God. In the New Testament, the promise of creation restored is taken up in the promise of resurrection, most especially in the fourth gospel, in which themes of shalom and new creation are interwoven in the garden scenes surrounding Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The Joannine account of the passion and resurrection begins with the arrest in a garden and ends with the encounter of a man and a woman in a garden in the middle of which stands the cross as the tree of life. Australian theologian Mary Collar points out that here the evangelist is reprising the second chapter of Genesis just as in the prologue he's reprising the first chapter. On the evening of the first day following the resurrection, the risen Jesus breathes on his friends and speaks the word that gives life. Shalom or in its Greek cognate, Irene. This is a clear echo of the primal act of creation, but what is being created specifically is the church, 
as a community of shalom, which is to say a community that must embody God's promise for the whole garden of creation. Bonaventure constructs an eschatological vision using the imagery of Revelation, particularly chapters 7 and 21, which in turn are an echo of Isaiah chapters 21 to 24. The image of a new heaven and a new earth with the tree of life planted by the water in the centre of a garden, which represents nothing less than Eden restored. Here, the warrant for hope for the restoration of the whole creation is specifically identified as the remembered forward hope of resurrection. Bonaventure disagrees with St. Augustine here. Augustine understands the eschatological age of Shalom as being in eternity. Bonaventure, on the other hand, insists that the Shalom of creation must be the eschatological promise within history ushered in by the vision of St. Francis and bearing the hallmarks of Francis's radical identification with all created reality. That is, Bonaventure envisages a human praxis based on intersubjectivity, the treating of both human and non-human creatures not as objects of use but as subjects created to reflect the beauty and love of God. In this brief talk, I've offered an overview of ways of thinking about Christ as the centre of creation. With resurrection inaugurating a new creation and the end or telos of all things in Christ as the novum adventus, the new creation that is the promise of God. But what difference does it make to the Christian life of faith and what hope does it offer for a Christian eco-spirituality and praxis? Firstly, a new understanding that God's purpose is for the redemption of the entire creation means that we must look differently at our own relationships with and our use of the non-human world. It's important to notice that the approach commended by the insight of Maximus, Francis and Bonaventure is at odds with, a secular, deep, with secular deep ecology approaches that see humanity as well, just one species among many, although more pernicious and destructive. This rests on an inadequate anthropology. An adequate eco-theology that understands Christ as incarnate in all creation also recognises humanity as made in the divine image and capable either of destructive self-serving power or of living up to its primal vocation to serve and protect the garden of creation. Ecotheology must provide us both with a warning and with a reminder of who we are created to be. Secondly, the assertion that Christ is at the centre of created reality and is also the final telos of the more than human ecology is necessarily articulated through an understanding of resurrection as new creation. This leads us to a new understanding of the church as a down payment on the new creation characterised by the praxis of Shalom. And it offers a sharp note of challenge at both an ecclesial and a personal level. The salvation of the earth, it turns out, requires us. Thank you.